So it's Fowlis. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's fine. I said hashtag earlier and then you said hashtag. I'm like, okay, well, that's the, the <laughs> pronunciation. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and uh, we'll get started. So I titled this presentation and please uh, let me know if there's you see something funky on the screen. Um, if um, yeah, if you, if you see something funky. So uh, I titled this presentation, Latina OE Digital Humanities as Places of Joy and Cadencia for our students. Um, like um, Rupsi said, I am um, at Texas A&M University in San Antonio, which is a Hispanic serving institution in the South side of San Antonio. But a little bit more about my context and positionality. I'm an immigrant. Um, and, but most of my experience, I've lived in the U.S. more than, than where I grew up in Mexico. So I identify as U.S. Latina with my, um, most of my experience has been as a Midwest uh, Latina. I lived in Ohio for, for a number of years. Um, I'm bilingual, who prefers to translanguage. I'm a professor, I'm a researcher. And at the institution where I work, uh, we have about 77% of students who identify as Latina and Hispanic. And this is important for me and for the work that I do because I center um, the students and the work you know, of digital humanities and the work of oral history. And I wanted to provide a couple of definitions of how I think or see um, you know, words like querencia. And so I'll read this for you. Um, digital archives can be places in which querencia can be nurtured given that the students are um, focused on the diverse histories and contributions, sorry, the digital uh, archives, uh, contributions of Latin, Latino, Latinx uh, students. Uh, when connected with students' own experiences, digital archives can be used as a vehicle to foster inclusive learning environments and integrate culturally sustaining pedagogy. This is also particularly important at my institution and in my department that has gone through, you know, uh, years uh, in the past three, four years of really rethinking our mission um, as a department to really uh, care for our students and offer, um, you know, linguistically and culturally appropriate and sustaining pedagogy, um, you know, for, for the students that we serve. So this also ties, you know, uh, to the institution, to the department. And I also wanted to think about joy, right? So Cadencia is a space, you know, it's a home where students can find a home in the things that we, that we do, right, and the, the things that they study. Um, and I'll go into um, a little more detail in, in a little bit. But uh, one of the things that um, when, when we work with uh, BIPOC archives or um, studies, right, um, we, we do acknowledge that there is, you know, uh, a history of hardship, racism in our communities. But I also want the students to have an opportunity to really see how our community is experiencing joy and practicing joy, despite um, you know those um, maybe um, experiences of oppression. And so I really like what Imana Perry um, says um, about this. Um, and she says, joy is not found in the absence of, absence of pain and suffering. It exists through it as she lists um, how racism and many forms of discrimination have affected black lives. She continues that injustice is inescapable. So yes, I want the world to recognize our suffering, but I do not want pity from a single soul. Sin and shame are found in neither my body nor my identity. Blackness is an immense and defiant joy. So this idea, right, of, um, resilience, right, of finding um, spaces and, and, and places of joy in the community. I want to also student uh, to, to, uh, for students to really think and engage in that uh, practice. And, and, you know, just, just by having conversations with students, we can immediately um, see how, you know, our communities, their own communities are experiencing that. So a little more, Cadencia um, can be found uh, 
answer. Herencia can be the place where students develop a sense of belonging in the town and state in which they study by learning about the experiences of other Latinx or Latina individuals in those locations. And um, as we know, uh, many of our Latino students leave behind more than home uh, when they, uh, where they grew up, right? They um, also leave important cultural practices, bi bilingualism and social ties nurtured in their everyday life uh, to arrive at colleges and universities um, that often lack the resources for a smooth transition into academic life. Um, even at an institution like um, like where I work, where the majority are Latino students, um, this transition, right? It's it's uh, sometimes hard for our students, right, into academic life, into um, or even into thinking about their own communities as um, uh, no, you know, places of knowledge, right, where we can learn uh, from from them. Uh, certainly, this was the case at. Uh, my previous institution, which was predominantly uh, white, uh, a, a predominantly white institution. Um, so uh, again, going back to what Imana said in, in terms of joy, right? Um, defiant joy, so jubilo desafiante, um, is the embodiment of joy despite experiences of oppression, discrimination, gentrification, and racism, but also joy as something we deserve um, it is wholeness. Uh, for multilingual communities, joy is also feeling and being free to speak the language they want. Um, so in the work that, um, that I do with students and when we think about um, maybe um, building an archive, right? A digital archive about our community. I, I really have them think about their audience, right? And um, what is the best representation of their community? <clears throat> and oftentimes, right, we think about this bilingual component. Can we um, create archives that are multilingual, right? Uh, for, for that sole pur purpose of um, maybe a just, more just representation of our community. Um, when I uh, work with students, I, um, I incorporate uh, Tara Yoso's uh, framework of um, community cultural wealth, um, and she describes this as a critical race theory approach to education, which involves a commitment to develop schools that acknowledge uh, the multiple strengths of communities of color in order to serve a lar larger purpose of struggle towards social and racial justice. So within... Um, that community cultural wealth uh, framework, she talks about the different types of capital, right, that our students bring into, with them, into the into our classes, right, into all our classrooms. Um, and so, you know, I go and, and, and we talk about the different, the different types. And for the, the work that I'm going to um, specifically focus on today, um, I, um, uh, the student who I worked uh, more closely with in creating this um, this um, digital humanities project uh, really captured the idea of linguistic capital and um, aspirational capital. Um, and so I'll read briefly what those means and I, so um, bear with me. So aspirational capital, um, just a reminder for some, some, you know, if you are not familiar with this, is the ability to maintain hopes and dreams for the future even in the face of real and perceived barriers. Um, this resiliency is evidenced in those who allow themselves and their children to dream of possibilities beyond the, their present circumstances, often without the objective means to attain those goals. And then linguistic capital um, includes the intellectual and social skills attained through communication experiences in more than one language um, or style. Uh, it reflects the idea that students of, co of color arrive in, uh, at school with multiple language and communication skills. And obviously with our Latino students, um, you know, uh, being able to speak um, or incorporate Spanish and English into the work that they do is part of that linguistic capital, right? So a community cultural um, wealth model flips the deficit model script so that educators value and incorporate the often unrecognized experiences and resources that students bring with them. 
Um, so for the project um, that I that I um, mentored my student into, you know, she identified these two sources of um, capital, right? And she and it was really, um, um, I guess, um, refreshing to hear her uh, think about how um, you know how she brings that, how her family has instilled this in, in her, right? And so she talked about aspirational aspirational capital in the form of consejos or advice, encouragement, and um, and also in uh, the form of la bendición, right? Like the blessing that you get from your family to to you know so that your school, you know your your projects go well, et cetera. And also um, their linguistic capital, right? So uh, being bilingual, biliterate, biliterate and by culture um, as part of who they are and um, what they can bring to this, um, you know, to their work. Um, so at the beginning of the class, you know, when I, I teach um, this um, Latino digital, digital humanities class that incorporates oral history into it. So students, um, are both learning about uh, what digital humanities is. Um, they're exploring uh, different digital humanities projects, projects primarily um, of Latino, Latina, Latina communities. Uh, but also we we look we take a look at other projects uh, from other uh, um, underrepresented groups. Uh, but one of the things that we've been able to do too is to have students specifically look. Um, as some of the archives that have been reviewed. Um, and so this is a huge plug to, to our um, journal uh, in which um, my colleague uh, Jennifer Lozano and I um, uh, co-edited, put together this group of digital humanity archives um, that incorporate, you know, oral history as, as one of the main components, right? So I had students sort of look at it, review, read the reviews, uh, the overview of the project, and then also, um, you know, look at other ones. They also had um, a time to practice in writing their own review, right, based on the models that we, uh, that we provided, that I provided for them. <laughs> Uh, but I really wanted them to focus on, um, you know, the use of oral history. How are they being used? What um, additional um, sort of artifacts or platforms or features do we see in archives that continue to tell that story of that community, right? Or enhance the the story. So I think I emphasize uh, the oral history component uh, component so much that whenever we looked at digital humanities projects that were that did not have oral history uh the students would ask well like i wish this one had oral histories right because so they were used to like hearing from people's stories but obviously there were um other ways that the the digital archives were built um that also um, incorporated maybe feedback or comments or blogs where the uh, the people that built them or those that engaged with the archive um, left a comment or something like that. So different ways of um, thinking about um, digital humanities um, projects. So um, one of the things that we are um, that we really think about, right, and in, in creating or building or beginning um, our digital humanity projects. So the the students choose. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the topic that they want to explore. Um, obviously, it has to be, you know, one of the, the um, goals in the, in the class is that they, um, you know, think about uh, what story is missing, right? Uh, what's the, what story out there is missing um, or what story they're interested in? Um, is it connected to them? Is it connected to their, their family, their community, right? Um, and so we think about um, the people that we might engage with uh, as collaborators, right? And I use this model by, oh, it's not showing here. Um, and of course, now I'm blanking on the name, but I can provide that, that, um, uh, that um, information um, later on. Um, so um, 
I use this framework that is not my framework, so I'll give you that reference later on. Um, so how do we connect with our, our, our collaborators who are our collaborators? Um, how do they benefit uh, from this interaction, right? Um, so I want the students to really think about this is not just a class project, right? This is something that uh, maybe think about how will this continue to be to live right um, outside of this class. Are you going to continue to build on it? Um, is it going to be shared? You know, are you building something that then can be shared with that particular community? If it's a family um, a project, right, that they end up doing, how can the family members, you know, have access to this? Um, so, um, you know, I also think about, I have them think about the tools or methods, right, that are for the purpose of uh, multi-directional collaboration, um, can also, can the uh, people who they interview um, or they're building this archive about um, provide feedback, right? Can they um, help you um, maybe even ask the questions, right? Uh, that you're trying to explore, can they, can they have a say, right? Um, and so, and lastly, for the purpose of, of my class, but also for the purpose of just, you know, um, making this archives um, meaningful to those of us who are creating, right, and in particular our students, is um, um, how are our students transformed by this interaction with the archives, right, with the, with the things that they're building, with the community in this case, right, they're, they're um, physically, right, they are uh, interviewing a person and then they're providing information, you know, to curate, um, the story based on the information that they that they gather from from the um, narrator, right? Um, how would this work? Um, strengthen their communities, the history of that community, the history of the impact, right, of of uh, that person's life into the way we think or understand um, Latinx uh, Latinx history um, or engagement or culture, etc. Um, and then I want them to really think about what a new understandings that they gain from this work. Um, so those are that's the framework that that we try to use, right, um, to to help us design um, and conduct this work, oral history, and then um, the the archive. Um, so this is the work that my student uh, Lydia Flores, and this is. Uh, with her permission, um, and she created an archive that she titled Undocumented Students in the Education System. Um, she wanted to think about how uh, different um, uh, students had uh, navigated um, higher ed in spite of uh, maybe having a temporary status, right, like DACA or being, or being undocumented. So she wanted to think about uh, or explore or find, you know, more information about how they navigated um, immigration policies. How do they care for their own mental health and emotional health? Uh, was the university or the higher um, um, ed institution um, receptive to this or, you know, do they provide resources? Um, how did they understand the cultural cap capital that they brought into, you know, this um, journey? Um, and then what was what was it like for them after graduation to um, to find jobs, careers, or maybe even um, move on to to grad school? So she decided to interview um, four um, four people uh, that included her parents, um, and then um, I helped her identify some some former students that um, that might want to contribute. So I connected um, the students with her and then she had another personal contact. We design um, the, uh, the questions. Uh, These questions here that you see are obviously in Spanish, but um, she code switched. So she allowed, which is one of the things that I always um, you know talk about, like with it, when we do interviews, especially oral history, we should be ready to um, maybe ask questions back and forth in English or Spanish and really allow the narrator to answer in the uh, language that they prefer. Um, so, you know, so she constructed um, the, 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 um, the questions that she wanted to ask uh, from her, her, um, her narrators. 
And then what she did is that um, after she was done interviewing everybody, she um, scripted um, some of the, what her end project was, um, um, the, the oral history part of it um, became a podcast in which she um, uh, narrates, you know, sort of introduction of the issue, the, um, the topic, right, of the interviews. And as you see here, she has um, scripted, you know, what she's going to say. And then she has um, uh, inserts from the, um, like sound bites from each of the interviews that she conducted. So this was a lot of work. This is, uh, I was, I'm very proud of her. She's actually um, uh, has presented this uh, work um, at three conferences already. Um, and people seem really interested to, to really think about how to do this, right? And, and, and the ideas um, that she shares from with the audience about this project. But yeah, she had to really do a lot of editing. Um, I insisted that she needed to um, in, incorporate her own story, her own voice into the podcast. So, so again, she like really had to think about how, where do I fit into this, right? So this um, so this is not just about um, a community, right? Um, uh, but also about um, her, right? Where where does she fit in 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 this? Um, and um, so the end results are a um, oral history, which she shared in the forum. Um, you know, a collect collective, I guess, oral history, which she shared in a form of a podcast. Um, she also created a timeline and story map that consisted in um, uh, policies uh, introduced to Congress Congress, um, and in individual states uh, that align with the narrators and, their, and the story that they told. Um, so I wanted to show you real quick um, her timeline. Um, can you still see my screen? Are you seeing the Omeka uh, screen, I hope? Yes, okay. So this is the timeline she created. And if you could see, she goes through the different dates and what had happened, right, during that time in terms of immigration policies. And she does it all the way to when um, DACA was implemented, right, the DREAM, uh, the Dream Act. Um, so that's an, uh, an important component um, that she wanted to highlight um, in her um, archive, and then she also um, tell us a little, tells us a little bit about the narrators, like where they're from, where they went to school, um, where they are now, right? Just a little bit. Um, and she was, although the um, interviewees or narrators um, gave consent to include their names, um, she also was just, you know, careful about how much information to disclose um, um, in regards to this. And I'm going to play just a little bit, uh, a short example of her podcast. Okay. You have an advantage there, um, but of course the disadvantage that my parents didn't speak English. So when I, as the oldest, start to, to learn and go to school, I had to experience like, and still do like uh, this, understanding of a different world that my parents and my other family members don't live in or don't are not invited to because they don't know the language so yes there is like obviously a, a head a head start when you learn from a younger Asia language and like that like English and then with Dr. Hablar en inglés puro español puro español um Creo también por el respeto a mis a mi mamá, esa es mi familia por si hablaba mal de ella o, o algo. Este, pero ya um, todo en la casa español, en la escuela inglés o tratar de hablar el inglés. Pero sí había un programa. Majority of them are from Mexico. What we know now as DACA exists, there were various other policies presented in Congress in hopes to provide a path for citizenship for children brought to the U.S. Who have so just that I can also share the link uh, later with you, um, but um, you heard uh, the beginning, uh, the first two voices were narrators, and then I forgot to go back to the beginning where she's actually introducing the topic, and, and then she also talks a little bit about her story. 
Um, so I want to end with this um, um, uh, quote uh, from an article that my colleague Stacey Alex and I are working on, and is to say that as educators invested in developing anti-racist curriculums, we can invite students to engage with digital archives in ways that ask them to directly confront the racialized erasure of these stories and official narratives, the inclusion of oral history archives, is most transformative when they are used to analyze how the stories people tell about themselves, including their cultural practices, traditions, language, et cetera, reveal specificities about their communities that are often lost or ignored by dominant uh, narratives. Um, so yeah, this is, I'm happy to um, take questions or share um, any links and uh, that you might want. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Fallis. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, really thrilled with your talk. If uh, you have questions, uh, please um, use the hand raising feature. So you pop up to the top of the screen and we can call on you. And or if you don't feel like coming on live on on the zoom you can just put your question in the chat but i see we have a question from jennifer so please go go ahead jennifer thank you uh this project that you've presented that you've given the detail about with your student is just incredible it's sort of like the gold standard of what i would uh, like <laughs> to achieve as well i do a oral history project with my students in a class and so i was just wondering uh i apologize if you probably you did mention some of this at the, at the beginning, but could you remind, um, was this an independent study? Was it part of a class? Is this a grad student or an undergraduate student? Yeah. I'm just thinking about like what expectations mm -hmm. we could have for our students, depending on what level they're at. <laughs> um, so it was an undergraduate course, but the student um, was taking my class with, it, with everybody else, but she was also an honor student, which, um, uh, with her honors program, it required her to do to dig a little deeper right into the the project. But I would say that this can be done if I remove some of the other things that we do in the class, I think it could really be a project that everybody can do. It'll be um it'll just be more um more they'll need more um assistance, right in terms of like sound editing or and things like that. She was really a pro. Like I just kind of basically showed her where to go and she did it and and I'm like, wait, like I haven't seen this. Oh yeah, like and then she would tell me, right and and she did she did wonderful. but um yeah, I have to say that she was an honor student and, and student in this in this particular class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That helps a lot because I was thinking about how it takes me so long in the semester to get the students <clears throat> ready with oral history methods to go out and do the interviews. And then they do a fantastic job, but then there's no time in the semester to build in the digital skills. And I just was, right. I was won over by the podcast voice. Like your student has nailed the podcast voice. Absolutely. <laughs> it's incredible. And we had some examples, like I gave her some examples, right? I got that also having models, right? That helps a lot for the students. Oh, yeah. okay. This is what it should sound like. I had worked uh, with another friend about we cross listed some podcasts and and her podcast is that type of um, oral history with narration um, and so um, I showed her that and I showed her like the scripting you know what this is the best way to like organize yourself and she just ran with it you know but yeah a lot of models um, and and she was able to do it in that in that way. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Your your work is incredible. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll take moderator's prerogative and ask a question while we see if there are other folks who have questions. And one of the things that I'm thinking about is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I worked at Salem State University for nine years before my current job. And um, but I found that this actually is, is very similar regardless of student uh, of student demographics, but that our students tend to come feeling really more comfortable with the kinds of assignments they've been asked to do in the past, mm -hmm. like write a paper, as opposed to do something that's so different. And I'm sort of curious in the ways that you've been thinking about digital humanities and oral history with your students, which is you know, something that's going to be really new to them, 
how have you approached this and how have you tried to help them sort of get across that sort of little hump of right there is always that hesitation like what do you want me to do and like how you know what is this like um there's no test <laughs> that's what they ask me there's no test in this class I'm like no um, but you you do have a lot of time that you have to invest in the class in other ways, right? Um, so what, so uh, Lydia, who worked in this project, she was super excited. And she's like, I've never done this before. This is so cool. So she was like exceptional in many ways, right? Um, so the, per the perfect student to work with um, in that regard. And her um, major is political science, you know, something different too. But um, so what I when I talk to them about this, it's like, OK, we're we're engaging in different types of skills um, that might be unfamiliar to you, might be um, uh, maybe even like the, the idea of them like recording or like engaging with like, you know, hitting record on the recorder or like the idea of a podcast can be a little intimidating for them. Um, and so I tell them, I mean we are going to have a lot of practice. Like you are not alone. I'm there like, you know, different than maybe an essay or a, um, a test, right. Where it's a little bit more individual work here. Like I am there for you. Like I am there to like guide you and help you. And, you know, especially if you're having like technical, um, issues and stuff. And I said, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but we'll figure it out together. You don't have to like be stressed about that. Um, and then we talk about what kind of skills are this, you know, are you are you gaining uh, from the different things that you're doing in this classroom for the workforce? You know, this is one thing that uh, maybe they hadn't thought about. Um, I said, if you want to go to grad school, right, and you've done this type of work, you have a lot to talk about. You know, you have this experience already. Um, even, a, you know, as an introduction, as the, the first time you've ever done it, you've already accomplished a lot, right? Um, and so, and you have uh, something to show, like you can say, I've done this and here it is what I did, right? Um, so I talked to them in, 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 in regards to the skills that they are gathering from this, right? Um, when we do, uh, when we talk about story map or like the timeline, which is, can be, um, tricky at the beginning, you know, before they, they, um, they understand how the platform works. And then I ask him, okay, like, what did you gain from this? What did you learn? What is it? Um, what can you tell the world that you know how to do now? Right. Um, and then another thing I, I have to point out that uh, some of my students, I have a very diverse student body. Um, so I have students who are what we call like traditional age, right? Um, 18 to 22. And then I had um, in that particular class, I had people in their fifties there. Um, so different kinds of anxieties, right? <laughs> uh, they didn't think that they were going to be able to accomplish or to do this kind of technical stuff. And they they did it, right? And um, and so we, we took also time to like think about what have you gained, you know, from this experience? So, so yeah, and they, they do at the end of the semester, they, they, they can like list the skills that they've gained. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I've definitely found that sort of reflection and metacognition is, is a great way to help students actually see what they've learned. Um, mm -hmm. Alex? Hi, everybody. Uh, my apologies. I'm in the kitchen uh, making lunch. Um, uh, thank you, Elena, for, for this wonderful presentation. I, uh, I'm in the Spanish and Portuguese department at Yale University teaching the uh, heritage, uh, uh, Spanish for Heritage Speakers course uh, this semester mm -hmm. with uh, my colleague uh, Jorge Sages, uh, who's a social linguist that specializes in uh, Latinx Spanish. Um, and both me and him we we agree that the heritage designation for these courses are racist, uh, to say it um, uh, directly, um, because they separate uh, the 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 kids that grew up here or that just uh, immigrated from the other Spanish speakers, assuming that uh, their Spanish needs help. So mm -hmm. that the whole course, the history of the course was designed as a uh, as a remedial course. Uh, now mm -hmm. this might be a Yale thing. 
Uh, not something that I, I don't want to speak for other universities, but at, at Yale, definitely it, it's imagined like that. And part of our strategy, because we want to change the culture here, and Jorge is the director of the writing program uh, of the language program, so that helps that, that, that he's in a position of relative power. Uh, uh, part of our strategy to change the culture eventually leading to the elimination of the heritage course reimagining how everybody can just be together um through the through the projector uh is actually to use these kinds of problems so now in this in this class that i'm teaching we actually are giving i'll, I'll keep everybody posted if you're interested that we're, we are actually allowing students the freedom to do any kind of a number of projects digital or otherwise uh, including like a digital archive, but also interviews if they want to do it. A podcast. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a small team who wants to do a podcast, this kind of thing. And and the goal and the part of the strategy is that we figure if we actually move away from the paper, we're moving away from grammar, which is the alibi that people use in order to designate these speakers as uh, uh, you know remedial mm -hmm. or whatever. By moving into this multimedia projects. We kind of, it, it, it's a sneaky way of saying, you know, like, like, like uh, allowing us to achieve our, our anti racist goals. Mm -hmm. and, and I was wondering if you had thought about it like that, about, about your own work and, and, and the relationship to the, how different these types of projects are to like the, the writing assignments um, mm -hmm. in those terms. Uh, and it's okay if you hadn't. I just, I, I, I just imagine you would have by now. So I, um, at this institution where I am, um, and I, when I was at Ohio State, I built the Heritage Language Program. And so I do believe that there is a space for um, having students in heritage language, language courses, but not in a deficit model, not as a remedial, right? This is, um, we never, we never designed those courses and in, in, in within that framework. Um, and so where I am now, actually, all of our classes um, um, use the heritage language uh, pedagogy. So because the majority of our students are, are bilinguals, heritage language learners, et cetera, uh, we use just um, the heritage language pedagogy for all of our classes. So we, um, what we are doing now, because of the, the naming gets complicated, right? So uh, we just say Spanish language studies. We don't we don't design like, you know, uh, second language or heritage language, so it's all one. Um, this is mm, unique to our institution because of the numbers, et cetera, right? So we don't have two different programs as one, but the pedagogy that we use is heritage language, right? Um, so um, in all, and in all of our courses, we incorporate a type of um, digital component. So digital storytelling, uh, we encourage infographs, we, you know, public, pro public projects primarily. We do have some, you know, exams that, that, we, that we do on those like beginner intermediate courses. But really what we are advocating for is that students utilize the language skills that they have um, to produce public projects in whatever way that might be. So through a podcast, through, like I mentioned, maybe a website, informational um, PSAs. I like, uh, we, we did one uh, with one class that they were um, talking about um, health um, care services uh, for Latino communities, for bilingual communities. Um, so public service announcements are popular. But really what we want is a student to, we want to activate that, you know, cultural capital that they have um, that is more than how well uh, or how fluent, you know, they speak the Spanish. They can code switch. They can do, use trans, we use a lot of translanguaging in our classes. So really to, um, to unlock that potential, right? And to, to tell them that it's okay, right? That they are navigating a world that um, speaks two languages, that is bicultural. And our audience is always, for those public projects, is always our community, right? Um, and so, um, so that's the way that we've been thinking about, right? So that the students can use the language that they have in ways that benefit their community and themselves. So I don't know if that answers your question, but this is uh, one way to do it, right? 
no, no, thanks a lot. It, ha it helps a lot. It helps me also place in context how, how different the situation here is. Like we have similar goals, right? Which is allow them, give them the, the space for dignity by, through recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but like how different the, the, the strategies are, even if we're doing more or less the same thing, which is allowing them to Absolutely. do these kinds of projects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yes. I think there was a question on the... Um... Yes, we have a question in the chat from Mary, uh, from Mary, and I'll go ahead and, and read it for mm -hmm. you and for everybody. I am curious to know how you've gone about working with communities and teaching students how to work with communities ethically in terms of gaining permissions to share their oral history interviews in addition to collecting them. So teaching students about who owns the histories once they are collected and issues that might come up if the histories being collected are sensitive, uh, e.g. whether or not they should be published at all, how they might receive requests to take them out of circulation, et cetera. Great question. Uh, yes, great question. So yeah, we do talk about informed consent, um, especially with oral histories, right? So the whoever they interviewed, um, they interview, they have to sign an informed consent. And we talk about that this informed consent is not final, right? It's not like we got you <laughs> forever, uh, but rather that if something comes up and they need to, for their oral history to be removed from the public, um, that is also something that we can do. So interestingly, there was a, a student who decided to, um, who was interested in um, uh, interviewing this uh, trans uh, person, I forget, well, um, how they identified, but this trans person who is, who was who is Latino, Latinx, um, and um, you know, and she went through all of the like permission, talking about okay, this is is ultimately going to be a public archive, um, you know. So she went through the steps of explaining what this was about, and so what they decided was that um, um, this trans person wanted to tell the story, but also obviously wanted to be protected. Um, and so we kept the name out of the interview. So no name, no, very careful about not um, providing details that identified them uh, to a specific I don't know, community. We took every step to make sure that there was no identifiable features there that could uh, lead to to them right and so um and she did the archive was wonderful the story was wonderful um and she really took care of that privacy issue right she was very um she was already an advocate right for this community so she knew um how important it was to um to keep uh, that privacy right um there let me see if there was another I think that was the most tricky. And when she brought it up, I said, okay, so what you want to do, it would be consider a vulnerable community. Um, do they want to, is this what they want to do? Do they want to do it? What, what is their, do they have any hesitations? Because I said, if they, there's any hesitation, you know, about doing this work, then you need to find somebody else, right, to, um, to interview or another project, um, because we don't want to do harm, right, to this community. Um, so, so yeah, I have, I think they probably can quote me about like, you know, <laughs> you need to like respect people's privacy. And um, one of the things that was really, um, I went to the Oral History Association um, meeting last fall and I was uh, listening to a colleague from Canada um, that had a similar project and um, the students were presenting about this. And one of the student groups said that, you know, they had done all this work, they had uh, collected the story, they had edited it. And then the woman that they end up interviewing decided that they didn't want, they didn't want to, to have the interview be public. Um, so it's really like, and I told that my students, like, it is possible that you're going to do all this work that you're going to, you know, create this. And then the person could say, I'm sorry, like I'm having second thoughts. I can't do this. I said, that's fine. Like that's not failure on you. Uh, that's, you know, you will still get credit, you know, cause students get very afraid about like, how is this going to affect my credit? 
uh, my uh, grade or, you know, um, and so I, I also assure them, right? So you did the work, you collected, uh, maybe we can, like, I can listen to, to this or view the work, but then we destroy it, right? We destroy everything um, to honor that person. So that's how I've handled it. It hasn't been an issue so far and they really understand. And I see those consent forms. I have them upload the consent forms that they collect from their narrators. Um, just as an exercise, because uh, the students also, I also tell them to share my information because I am also like another contact for them if something happens, right? To uh, for the community, the narrators. Um, so, so there's steps that we take um, for for that. Mm -hmm. And then Mary's asked, "What what does your informed consent paperwork look like?" Um, so I use, so the Center for Folklore Studies at the Ohio State University, where I have all my oral history uh, project has an informed consent, um, that sort of, um, asks for the student, the student, the narrators, the participants, um, basic information. And then, um, it, they have two choices, whether it's full consent and, and there's a description of that or partial consent, um, and so, so really partial consent would be that they, they only want, um, uh, they don't want the, the, the story to be public, but they still want it to be part of the archive in, in case somebody asks for it, right? But not publicly available for anybody. Um, or they might say, well, I don't want my name on it and, and we can make arrangements for that. Um, and so that's, you know, a signature that the person that's collecting the story and the person, the narrator um, signs, and um, and then we keep that on file. If, since it's oral history, oral histories don't need an IRB, and we don't work uh, necessarily with um, vulnerable communities, right? Um, and if we do, right, so, so we're talking about trans uh, people or undocumented, um, I stress to to my students or whoever is going to be doing this work that maybe there's first that they have that the person understands right that this is a public item and if they so just to decide whether or not they want to participate and then second um, to really think do we need to have their names um, if if the narrator wants to have their names for their own political activism so be it, right? Because we don't want to censor somebody either. Um, but if um, they don't, then we don't need to include the name because the story is a story, whether it has the name or not. Um, it is informing, you know, a, a sort of a, a greater narrative of the experiences of undocumented students in this case or uh, trans people, if that was the case. But um, but yeah, so that's, that's a kind of form that I, I continue to use, I've, you know, I've changed, um, we have it in English and Spanish too, so that um, uh, the narrators also could choose which one they feel more comfortable signing. Um, so yeah, so those are the steps that we, that we take. Thank you so much. Well, let me ask one more question uh, while we see if there's anybody who wants the final question here. And it's, how do you deal with grading? This is definitely something that a lot of the folks in the DEFCON community, uh, particularly those who are new on the newer side of digital humanities are kind of wondering about, mm -hmm. you know, we're working in these genres that our students are not used to, and even, or even we ourselves may have sort of variable levels of confidence in our ability to actually assess an, mm -hmm. out an output that is, you know, different from the ones we're trained to assess. So how do you approach that? So I tell them right away that I'm not like, I know that a lot of them do not have technical expertise. So I don't grade on technical expertise, but I do <laughs> grade on um, uh, making sure that the steps were, were uh, followed. So for example, in the oral history, I said, I say, there is many ways for you uh, to make sure that the, that your you have a good audio. If your audio audio is not good, you know, on the recording, that's some that's on you, right? That's that's something that you didn't take care of, right? You you need to make sure that it's in a quiet space when you record. And so I am I am looking for like quality of sound, 
not excellent, right? But make sure that there is no, you know, fire alarm going on when, when you're doing this or a dog barking or, you know, what, what did you do to ensure that the quality uh, was there? Not only for the class, but for the narrator, right? This is respecting also people's story and we want the best possible way to do this. Uh, we do have a studio in the at the university, so that's always an option for them. Um, so again, um, there is the, um, the audio quality. Um, there is ways for me to make sure that the questions are appropriate, right? Sometimes they're not the best interviewers, right? Even though we practice, they get nervous. But I really don't grade them on that unless they really didn't make any effort, right? It's apparent that they didn't make an effort, which has never been the case so far. Um, and then each of the items for the archive, so I, I grade individually, right? So the story map has a grade, uh, the timeline has a grade. Um, the the, the uh, Omeka um, side, that, that's what we've been using, has a grade because I want to make sure, because I tell them you need to put um, tags, right, or keywords. And so I ask, like, how many they should include for each item and why the citation, because it generates the citation for you, right? So um, I want them to see that and to tell, you know, so that they know what the expectation is. So that's the things that I grade um and 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 it's been mm, I mean the first time I taught it I was also unsure I'm like oh my gosh like what am I <laughs> really grading like how um and so uh, technical um quality not so much but the steps that make sure that they completed you know um the things that that it should be you know I say maybe at least 10 items on your timeline, at least 10, 10 items on your story maps, right? So, so if those things were completed in a, in a good enough way, right? Um, that's important information and important details, then, then they, they um, get a full grade, right? If they end up with five items only, then we need to talk, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's definitely a process. Mm -hmm huge process component. And that definitely, that definitely resonates with how I've, I've approached it. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So I just want to ask you all to join me and thank you, Dr. Fallis, uh, for your fantastic talk. We will have this uh, put together and up on our YouTube channel for sharing. And we hope you will join us um, for DEF CON speaker series events in the future. And you can visit our website at digitalethnicfutures.org and sign up for updates. So thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Fallis. Thank you.